Hello, everyone, and welcome to the Bada and Waisa Malaysia Talk Series, Spotlight on Sarawak, also known as Talk Sarawak. Today is the third instalment for our six-part talk on Sarawak's unique and diverse heritage. Spotlight on Sarawak was organised in conjunction with World Heritage Day and is created by our life members, Tan Sri Leo Mogi and Puan Sri Elizabeth with the support of leading ac academics and heritage specialists from Malaysia and beyond. We're extremely grateful that we were able to present this program in partnership with Petra Energy and supported by donors, Credo Foundation, Chahaya Mata Sarawak Berhad, Cook Private Equity and Centric PR. As council member of Badan Waris Malaysia and a team member of the Tok Sarawak Organizing Committee, I have the privilege today to, organize, to introduce Habsa Abang Salfi, our moderator. Habsa believes in reinventing herself, but one thing remains a constant, staying true to her heritage. Habsa's first job was, as, was in marketing with IBM, and she also pursued a career in properties. She is part of, of the founding member team of the Central Market Development, where they redeveloped it into a modern bazaar of traditional crafts and foods with the late Chen Bun Fi. They managed to save the biggest example of an art deco building in the region from being demolished. Hapsa is also well known for being the partner of Tom Abang Saufi Bran with her sister champion, championing iconic Eastern motifs and cuts with the use of ancient batik. Together with her sister Datuk Tom, they took Malaysian fashion on shows in major cities around the world. Now, Hapsa is known as the accidental artist. Food and cooking and visiting markets are her passion. She believes Sarawak food is unique and the taste of childhood that her mother brought to the family table remains her favorite cuisine. I now hand over you to Hapsa, who will introduce our speaker, Datin Donna, who will speak on Sarawak's exotic food heritage. Enjoy. Thank you very much, Surida. That was uh, nice of you to talk about the central market, especially. Um, I'm very honored to be part of this series of talk uh, organized by the uh, Badan Warisan. In particular, this topic about uh, exotic food heritage of Sarawak. It is uh, very little known outside Sarawak, even for different tribes. Uh, they don't know what the others doing. And uh, it is unique in the sense because there's so many different types of wild fruit and, and uh, herbs, which is not available anywhere outside Sarawak. So today we are going to be very, very privileged to be given a talk by Datin Dona Duri Wee, whom I've known since she was a little girl. So uh, Datin Dona is a very, very known person in Sarawak and in Kuching, we all know her as the NGO lady. She's a lady with a big heart and uh, I take it because she has got really good uh, parentage. She is of American and Iban, uh, her father is American, came to Sarawak and met this beautiful lady. I suppose fell madly in love with her. And that's Donna was born. <laughs> anyway, what happened is that um, he was a consultant for the woodworking uh, company at that time. And that was the beginning of plywood in Sarawak, right Donna? And uh, just a few nights ago, I was privileged to be in the company of her mother. This is one wonderful 87 year old, puts anyone to shame. I mean, I accidentally or rather stupidly challenged her uh, for a ngajat competition, not quite a competition to dance with me. And boy, did I do wrong because those knees of hers could really do the ngajat still 87. And uh, I'd say, Donna, you have really inherited very, very good genes. Oh, thank you. Uh, yeah. Uh, and uh, she still plays golf and uh, jogs regularly. And uh, it's her, her joie de vivre, being able to, to, I mean, she lights up a room as soon as she smiles and chuckles. And that is Donna's heritage, not just that. She, it was frequently, I remember she telling us about her frequent trips to the longhouse to her grand, to see her grandmother. And this has actually encouraged a deep love for her heritage, the Iban side. And, and that is why 
when she talks about the food today, is it actually from actual experience as a child? And uh, we'll be seeing here that. Being an NGO, she is now what you would say the, um, one of the things she is, she is the um, president of the, hang on. She is the president, current president of the SSPCA Sarawak, Society for the Prevention of Cruelty to Animals. And she is the deputy chairman of the Triple Guide, Guild Girl Guides. I was once a guide, I never knew that the name has changed. <laughs> she is the immediate past president of the Eurasian Society of Sarawak. This is when her culinary journey began, I suppose. And the, the book, a book was published by this society in 2011 and it won the prestigious World Cookbook Award at the Goman Festival in Paris. It is a must-have book. I must say, I read it. It's not just about the, the uh, recipes, but it's a warm story it's about the different families that she that it did the recipes. Donna will elaborate on CHASS, the Culinary Heritage and Art Society of Sarawak, and how it started and evolved, and how it has garnered a pre the prestigious UNESCO Creative City Network for Kuching. We are very proud of what Donna has done. In fact, Anak Sarawak yang murni, I would say. Yeah. Donna is also friends of the Stroud Museum. And in 2019, she was invited by TED Talk, TEDx, to be a speaker. And she spoke on matters close to her heart. And the title was Animals in Our Environment. We are all connected. Donna obviously is a very, very busy person. I was very, very lucky to catch her for an hour in Kuching. And uh, she gave me a very run through of what she's going to talk. I'm very excited to hear it. She is a mother of three wonderful gentlemen. Oh. And <laughs> oh, I'm terribly sorry, four. Wow, Donna. <laughs> and a grandmother and of one and soon to be two. So this lady just doesn't just uh, do NGO. She walks, talk and everything. Before I hand over to that and Donna, I would like to remind our audience to send a question to the Q&A box. We will try to answer as many as possible. You can also send your question and comments on the chat box anytime during this talk. I would like now to present this to that and Donna Jury. Well, thank you, Hapsa, for that uh, lovely introduction. And I'd like to thank Banan Warisan also for inviting me to be a part of their heritage talk, um, specifically focusing on Sarawak. Okay. Let me just get my screen up. There we are. So today I'm going to be speaking to you about Sarawak's exotic food heritage. Now, for some of us who are tuning in from overseas, some of you are wondering where on earth is Sarawak? So uh, there you can see where I'm sitting right now is actually where the yellow star is. So that's Kuching, which is the capital of Sarawak, which is a region within the whole of Malaysia. And as you can see, Sarawak's vast land is about the size of the whole of the peninsula of Malaysia. So we have wide, a very wide area to cover geographically for our um, gastronomy. So in Sarawak, we have six major ethnic groups, the Iban, my mother is an Iban, the Malay, the Chinese, my husband is Chinese, Malanao, Bidayu, and the Orang Ulu. And from these six major ethnic groups, there are amongst the Dayaks themselves, there are about another 40 subgroups. So as you can see, ethnically, culturally, and gastronomically, we're a very diverse region. So as Hapsa mentioned earlier, my culinary journey actually began. I'm more of a, a hobbyist rather than a specialist. I'm not a chef, although I do enjoy cooking. And so it started with the Sarawak Eurasian Association. They had always spoke up about wanting to put their um, family stories together. But in Sarawak, we're a little bit different from um, West Malaysia, like in Malacca and Penang, 
where you generally tend to be of Peranakan or um, Portuguese descent. Whereas in Sarawak, we're what we call the new Eurasians. So like my father was American, we have those of British descent, Scottish, um, we have Hungarians, Germans. So all of us have different origins and different stories about how our families came to Sarawak. So we wanted to put our stories together, but we needed something that would bind all of us together. And then of course, during our meetings, we always had potluck. So then it came upon us and we said it was the food. It was the food that was our uniting factor. And so we put together this legacy cookbook. It's family stories with family favorite recipes and how you had to adjust them and um, for um, adjust them because some of the ingredients weren't um, available. And you tell the stories of when you make these dishes, who passed it down to you. And at the, at the later part of the book, we also have um, recipes of the land. That's where you get your Sarat Laksa, your Salai, and all these other um, recipes. And our publisher submitted this to the Goman Awards. So we first won Best in Malaysia, and that made us eligible to go for Best in the World. And I went to Paris with my friend Andrea. And I couldn't remember when they actually announced that the Eurasian Association had won. All I remember was Andrea sort of like pushing me, pushing me. And she's like, you won, you won, get up. <laughs> so I got on stage and accepted this award. And so the Legacy, the Sarawak Eurasian Association Legacy Cookbook won the best in the world award from the Gorman um, Cookbook Awards. And that was in 2011. And that is, as they say, where it all began. So over the years, um, having been invited by the Ministry of Tourism to set up a culinary heritage group, a few of us got together. Uh, and over the years, we organized festivals. We took ourselves to Hong Kong. And so we had to formalize this group of friends who were working so hard together. So we had to formalize it and form, we formed the Culinary Heritage and Arts Society, Sarawak. And we were one of the main movers together with Atelier who, who helped Kuching in their bid application to win the Kuching Creative City of Gastronomy under the, the UNESCO City of Gas, Cit, Creative Cities Network. So this idea was first mooted by Edric Ong because he has experience in um, the craft side. So Kuching is also a world craft city as recognized by the World Craft Council. And so he said, you know, UNESCO has this thing and it's called the Creative Cities Network. And for those of you out there, you should really go and look it up because there are actually seven different categories. So we chose gastronomy because we feel that we have such a strong story to tell, the unique, uh, ingredients that we have here um, and the, the traditional methods of cooking. And also we have other infrastructures such as education and the agricultural um, economy. So there are other fields. Um, it's, let me see if I can remember them all. It's cinema, literature, um, folk art and crafts. Yeah, well, you'll have to go and look up on the UNESCO uh, website and find out what the other ones are. So you can apply for this. It's given out every two years. And every two years, each country can submit two, two cities. So we're the very first city in Malaysia to receive this award. And it is something that we have to work on continually. We have six, we have to redo reports every six months. You have a four-year action plan. It's not just about the food that's on your table. It's about the whole system. Um, how you're helping your farmers, how you're um, encouraging youth to, to, to be a part of the whole um, food industry. So do have a look. So I'll show you some of our bid report. There was a beautifully put together bid report. So this was part of our bid application. Um, you can look at this on the website. I'm just taking some screenshots of what we had there. So spotlighting some of our special ingredients that we have. What you see here is actually the flour from the gula apong. And these are some of the, the items that are made with our gula apong. Similar to gula malaka. I'll explain more about that later. 
And then we talk about the fruits of the forest and other unique um, dishes that we have. So do go and check it out. This is our website. You, you can see the full report there and you can also see our bid video. So do go and check it out, www.kuchingcreativecity.com. So now we get into the ingredients and the heritage items that we have in Sarawak. So the first one that we would like to speak of, of course, is the staple food for, for all of us here, which is our rice. So what you see here are our traditional varieties. So you can see the very dark one there is actually the brass barrio hitam. And then if you move up to the left, then you see the brass mera, brass kaba, and then from a different region, Simunjan, you get brass wangi. And then there's a different variety, the barrio brass hitam wangi. And then of course, in the center, you have brass barrio pute. There's many different um, strains of rice from different regions. We have Gadong, we have Kanawit, Bajong, Biris. And these are just to name a few besides the, the various glutinous rice strains that we have as well. So Sarawak's aromatic rice is actually ranked amongst the most expensive in the world market, simply because it's difficult to produce. We don't have the multiple um, harvests that you might see of the commercial strains. Um, at most now you might get two harvests. Traditionally, we've only gotten one harvest. And I remember in April was the time when everybody puts in their orders for barrio rice, because if you left it too long, you wouldn't have any for the rest of the year. And as we were growing up, my grandmother actually had um, rice fields. So she would, when she got older, what she would do is she rented out her rice fields and she would take back um, gunny sacks of rice in payment as part, part payment for her rental. So that's why we always had a supply of hill paddy as we called it then. So in Sarawak here, the farmers practice the three T's, which we call um, tanam, which is plant, and then tungu, which is weight, and then tuai, or munuai, which is to harvest. And so most of the farmers here, um, the smallholders still practice what we call natural um, farming. So rice is used in various ceremonies and celebrations. Let me just show you here. This was a photo that I took in the old Sarawak Museum. This was during what we call here a mirroring ceremony. And this was to appease the spirits of the skulls that were still hanging in the old museum because they were going to renovate the museum and they needed to move the skulls. And so the last thing you want to do is upset the spirits and because they, they could cause havoc to all sorts, to your renovations and all that. So rice is used in ceremonies. We're up uh, end of this month on the 1st of June, we're going to be celebrating our Gawai Harvest Festival, which is dedicated to Thanksgiving for a good harvest of rice that you've had through the year. And there's various preparations. This is one of our um, chefs. We call um, Chef Mina. She's uh, from, from uh, she's an Orang Ulu. She's a Kalabit actually. And so what you see her preparing here, this was taken during our adventure, Sarawak's culinary adventure in, Sarawak, in uh, Hong Kong, sorry. So she's pre preparing senape, or what we call, also call nubalaya. And so she is pounding the rice. And after that, you will cook the rice. And then you will place it in the leaves, the daun isip. And this is actually the earlier form of packaging, especially for the men when they were going to work on their fields, if they would be away for the whole day, or if they were going away for two or three days, because it will last wrapped in, wrapped in the natural leaf, it would last for two or three days. So if they're going hunting, and then you would, it would the normal accompaniment would be something dry, like we have our own, um, the Orang Ulu have their own uh, surrounding, so beef surrounding or dried mushrooms, so that would be their packaging that they would have for their senape. And related to rice, you cannot speak of rice in Sarawak without thinking about tuwak. Tuwak is our rice wine. 
Tuak is also used in many, many ceremonies and each family has their own Tuak recipe. It is made from glutinous rice and it is handed down from generation to generation. Usually it is the women that make it, but now there's a lot of youngsters who are involved and many young, young men are now also involved in the making of Tuak. So here you see it's generally a family tradition passed down through generations. So this is a photo of myself and my mom, whom Hapsa was talking about. And uh, she's teaching me and also my son, Darren. And that is my uh, in-law, Laura. My Cheung Chunke, or how you say in Bahasa, is she's my Ipa. So we're making tuak. So you can see the round balls, that is the yeast. And I still use my mother's old dragon jar, which is glazed on the inside. So you place, you, you steam the glutinous rice and let it cool. And then you mix it with the pounded yeast, make sure it's mixed together. And my mom likes to put hers in a muslin cloth. Um, that is to allow the, um, how you say, filtering of the tuak as it ferments. And then you close it up and then one month, uh, uh, two weeks later, you check to make sure that your tuwak is alive, make sure it's fermenting. And so you can see there the fermentation that is taking place. And then you have to cover it up again. And then a couple of weeks later, you will add in your sugar and then leave it again. And then it takes about six weeks generally to brew a nice um, jar of tuwak. When I got married, my mother had to make seven jars of tuak and it was all finished within one day. The making of tuak has its own taboos. If you're in the longhouse and you're making your tuak, you must offer some of the rice to the skulls that might be hanging there. Otherwise, again, the spirits might get angry that you didn't offer them anything and then they might stir your tuak and make it go sour. Also, my mom told me that when you're making tuak, you're not supposed to gossip. You're not supposed to speak loudly because otherwise when people are drinking your tuak, they might get um, very loud and um, unruly, but I don't really see that not gossiping and not speaking loudly is going to change any of the behavior if they've had enough tuak. And also there is a pantang that any woman who is having her monthly period cannot make tuak and should not be near you when you're making your tuak. Again, this would cause the tuak to spoil. And our next ingredient is pepper. This photo here shows pepper that is actually grown in my garden. So you can see um, when it's just about, it's green, generally it's green. We actually make uh, green, pepper sambal as well. And then it ripens into red and yellow berries. And you can actually see on this photo as well, as it dries, it starts to turn black. The skin on the outside turns black. And that is where you get your black pepper. It's actually just a drying process. In order to get white pepper, you have to soak the black pepper in water and then you rub off the skins. And then inside you'll be left with the white kernel. And so this is why um, white pepper tends to be more expensive than black pepper, um, because it's just a longer process of getting it to the white pepper. So pepper is actually a very big export product. Um, the cultivation of pepper started about 100 years ago. Um, most of the, some of the strains here are um, traditionally from India. And it was started mostly by the Chinese settlers then. And Malaysia is one of the top five producers of pepper in the world. And then of Malaysia's stock, 98% of, of it comes from Sarawak. And I believe last year there was a value, no, sorry, in 2019, there was a value of 1.9 billion that um, pepper contributed to our GDP. So that was our pepper. Oh, and next here we come to Sago, another very famous product. Now Sago, you can see here, these are the trunks that have been cut. Usually when they're about 15 years old, they, might, they will cut, cut the trunks of the Sago palms. And of course the easiest mode of transporting, down, uh, transporting them is to tie them together and just float them down the tributaries to 
to where you want to be. The Sago, pro Sago products, actually, um, this was what we learned during the research that we had to do for our gastronomy, uh, our bid to be recognized as the city of gastronomy. And I didn't realize that the market value was so huge for this as well. So they export about 90 million ringgit worth. A lot of it goes to West Malaysia and also to Japan. Because um, the Japanese use a lot of uh, sago flour is actually gluten free. So that would be a, a, a newer use for the sago flour. Sago pearls are usually used in dessert. A lot of us uh, eat that when we have our gula malaka. And in this photo here, you can see our roasted sago pearls. And this is what the Milanao would generally eat with umai, which is a raw fish dish, which is uh, marinated with lime and chili and onions. And the starch can also be made into linut, uh, which is a glue-like, it has a glue-like texture, um, which is eaten with many condiments, uh, such as your um, yam stock, cooked asam or any sambal blachan. Um, and it's a very popular dish amongst the Milanao. It also can be used in other dishes. Tumpik, I have a photo of Tumpik to show you later on. Um, we make karapo, we make tabaloi, which is a biscuit uh, made out of sago powder, sago flour, sorry. And it's also used in textile production. We actually have now have um, linut, batik linut, which instead of using the wax, you actually use the glue, the linut, uh, sago glue, so, uh, to, just to keep it simple. And that blocks out the dye. And so that was the one that will give you the, when you do your color blocking in batik production. So now we have batik linut. And of course, living within those trunks are our sago worms. Now this is something that everybody is challenged to eat if we can find it because it's such a popular delicacy actually it's quite hard to find it in the markets nowadays because they really do get snapped up and you can eat it raw it's a great source of pork uh, protein you can eat it raw you can have it dry fried my friend told me that it tastes like popcorn if you dry fry it you can have it grilled i've tried the grilled ones and they're actually quite palatable um, it has a creamy texture and a, a nutty taste is what I remember. And then smoked and then of course the more um, exotic use for this is now they have um, sushi. They have sago worm sushi. So that would be for the more adventurous. And here you can see it's um, this one bowl actually will cost you 10 ringgit. So they're not really cheap because they're very high, high demand here. So don't forget, when you come to Sarawak, you got to try our ulat mulong. Now we come to gula apong, which is from another palm. This one is from the nipa palm. So you have to go into the nipa forest, which is our mangroves. And you can see here, this is, what is his name? Pak Mahli. And um, he, he collects the nectar in the morning, he has to cut the stem of the nipa fruit and then he'll put his bottle there and then it will slowly drip, the nectar will slowly drip into the bottle. And what he does then is he pours all of this into his big quali, his big wok there, and he has to cook it for hours until it caramelizes and evaporates into a thick syrup. So this is very similar to gula malaka. But of course, in Sarawak, we always prefer our gula apong. It has a slight um, salty taste to it. So it's, called, it's like salted caramel. It has a slight salty taste to it because the mangrove palms are usually at the river mouth where the seawater and the fresh water mixes together. And so it, at the, the, the trunk of the palm is absorbing this. And this is why we get that slightly salty taste. So we use it Pak Mahli's wife made the cakes that you see in the photo here. Um, so uh, what is that? Kueh bongkang, kueh bongkong, and also the kueh, what did she call it now? Kueh parahu. Now this other um, product that is in the jars, this is a new product and it's called the apong salts. So how do you make this? Um, this is something that is promoted by Tanoti Foods, so it's quite a quite a new product here. 
and they burn the fronds. You can see the palm fronds. They burn the trunks of the old trees and the palm fronds. And then they collect the ash and the ash is placed inside um, containers which are actually woven from the palm fronds. And then they have to boil this and boil it and boil it and boil it until the water evaporates. And then when you, it starts to form um, crystals and then you will leave that to dry. And then that is where you get your apong salts. So that is something interesting that you can come. And of course, as the Gula Apong um, trend grows um, and demand increases, this is one way of ensuring that our mangroves are protected. This is another very exotic fruit. I have some here actually, so you can actually see how it's not that big. And so it, it's similar to Salak. It has a snake skin kind of um, outer layering. And then you have the soft pulp inside. What you do is you peel off the pulp. Where am I here? There we are. So you peel off the pulp and then you're left, you peel off the skin, sorry. And you're left with this very soft pulp inside. And that is super, super sour. I think this is the most sour thing you could ever try. And of course we make this into delicious sambals. Um, I made one the other day with, with um, Laura my in-law. Um, so you just slice up the skin, eh, sorry, slice up the pulp and there's a seed inside. So you slice up the pulp, then you mix it with your sambal blachan, which is made of chilies, garlic, blachan. And here we have, um, so different people have different recipes. My mom doesn't include uh, down and sabi, which is a wild uh, spinach, wild sawi. Um, but Laura's family, she said her father used to include the down and sabi. So what you do is it's a little bit bitter. So you get it and you would rub it together and then you would add some salt and that helps to draw out the, the, the natural juices from the leaves. And that takes out some of the bitterness and then you mix it all up together and it makes a lovely sambal. And also used in cooking with fish. Your ikan masa asam. So you can do ikan masa asam payat and it gives a very nice flavor to it as well. Um, here is something that is only found on the island of Borneo, where we are, or also, if I'm not mistaken, it's uh, in uh, Irianjaya. And this is our terong asam, or the sour eggplant. And I have one here for you. You can see. These have now gone up so much in price it now costs about 14 ringgit for a kilo. So you only get about three, whereas it used to be like four ringgit a kilo, but because of its popularity now, it's really gone up in price. And if you can see the photo here has a, a better representation, but the tattoos, which are also tied to our foods and the events that happen in your life. So the tattoo, the very famous Dayak tattoo, which the men tend to put on their shoulder is, uh, formed after the flower of the bunga of the tarong. So it's the bunga tarong, which you can see, uh, still see some here. And this is another one that we use um, for cooking fish, cooking prawns, steaming fish. So it has a slight tartness to it. So it, it, it gives, and it's uh, very nice once it's cooked. It's not so sour, but a little bit sour. As you can see, I, I do love my sour foods. So I do love my tarong asam. Another preparation that you can do again is uh, sambal, uh, sambal terong asam. So what you do is you buy the terong that might be a little wrinkly and you grill it. And once you grill it until it's soft and cooked, then you will peel it and then you chop it up nicely. And again, mix it in with a nice uh, sambal blachan that you might already have prepared. So that is something that's very delicious. And here, of course, this is our natural jungle fern organic, uh, as we like to say, our organic jungle ferns. Um, and so these can be found in almost every market here. I actually have some growing in the empty land next to my house. So some days if I haven't got any vegetables at home, we'll just go next door and pluck a few fronds and fry it up with blachan. Or you can do a karabu style. The photo here is midin. So there's different types 
Um, the bigger photo is what we call paku, the one that is already cooked, that is midin. It doesn't have so much leaf on it. It's more of just the curly frond at the end. And the whiter one down below is what we call paku uban because it uh, has white hair. White hair is uban in Malay. Uh, paku uban tends to be a little bit bitter. So not everybody likes the paku uban. But so you can see the various different um, ways of cooking. You can fry it with blachan. You can fry it with Chinese wine and garlic. And this one here is a uh, uh, karabu. So it's done with lime juice and just uh, you blanch it first, then you cook it. Uh, sorry, you blanch it first, and then you just add the lime juice and the sliced um, onions and chili as well. And again, yeah, it makes a very nice appetizing dish. Uh, here is uh, something else that has increased in price. As my grandmother would say in the longhouse, she says, no, once the Chinese know now how to eat something, the price would generally tend to go up. So here we're looking at buah dabai. This is Sarawak's unique black olive. And it can range in price from 35 ringgit a kilo or sometimes uh, 20 ringgit a kilo to 50 ringgit a kilo, I think we've spent on before. And how you generally cook it is you actually just soak it in um, warm water. You add salt and you soak it in warm water for about half an hour. And then the, it's, the flesh starts to soften and it's very creamy, um, similar to avocado, I would say. And so you can eat it plain with soya sauce. Some people like to add a little bit of sugar. Uh, some people, you can actually peel the skin off and fry it as well. You can fry it with uh, ikan pusu or anchovies, ikan bilis. So there's many different ways that you can have this. And then it's, it's actually generally grown um, further into the, in the interior. That's why also one of the reasons why it's quite costly is because of the cost of transportation. It cannot get too hot while it's being transported, otherwise it will start cooking. Um, it, you, when you receive it, it might be a little bit mushy. And there's various different types. This one here in the photo is actually quite short and round. You can actually get longer ones and the flesh inside generally tends to be yellow. Ah, another one that we have what we enjoy in Sarawak is the variety of durians. In Sarawak here, we don't generally tend to go for the Musang Kings or the D24. When the, the durian season comes out, we all flock to the markets and there'll be the, the durian sellers will be sitting there with their baskets of durian. And you will just ask them, you tell them, you know, I want bitter, I want sweet. And they will tell you, oh, this tree is very good. It's an old tree. And I know the, the, the tree in the kampong. And so this one generally tends to come up with the yellow flesh. And it's kind of like Russian roulette if you buy a whole basket. When you go home, when you open it. So generally, if I open my durians at home, if it's yellow and firm, then I'll pass that to my mom because she likes it yellow and sweet. If it's a little bit bluish, then I will take it because I like mine a little bit bitter. And what you see here is actually a wild durian. Uh, this is again from my own backyard. And so the flowers are a very deep pink. So a fuchsia pink and very fragrant. And they're pollinated by the bats that come at night. Um, the photographer Chen Li actually spent a whole week in my house um, setting up all his equipment every night to capture the bats as they came to pollinate um, the flowers. Also pollinated during the day by squirrels and butterflies and bees. And as you can see, this is what we call the durian nyaka. It's not very big. I think the fruit size is probably just about that big. And the flesh is bright orange and the taste is different. It's slightly drier. It's quite dry. And again, the taste is kind of nutty, sort of like a peanut butter. That's the taste of this one. So in Sarawak, we have nyaka, we have durian isu, so various types of wild durian, and they don't come out every year. Um, they tend to come out maybe every two to three years. And in Sarawak, we actually eat the durian flowers. When the flowering season comes, I believe we're one of the only 
peoples that actually eat the durian flowers. I know definitely in West Malaysia, they don't because I always hear West Malaysians in the market and they're asking the vendors, you know, what do you do with this? So we collect the durian flowers. You take off the pollen from the stems of the flowers. And then what you do is you blanch it. And then again, you can uh, fry it with sambal blachan. You can make a krabu again, krabu. Uh, my mother-in-law does a very nice krabu where you blanch it and you mix it with sambal blachan. And then you squeeze lime juice onto it. And then on top of that, you place um, boiled coconut cream. So very nice. And here we have, we have so many different types of jungle fruits that we would need an extra half an hour to go through all of them. So I don't have photos of all of them, but uh, and I haven't even named all of them here. But what you see down below is Wahtampui. There's two different versions. These are all jungle fruits. If you're running the, with the Hash House Harriets in the jungle, you'll see this fruit on the ground when it's in season. So Wahtampui, this is a red version. There's also a yellow version. And then in the um, baskets, homemade baskets that you see behind it is Buahangkala, or in Muka, they call it the Bulus. And this has a uh, creamy texture, uh, again, similar to avocados. So you eat it with a little bit of salt and a lot of people, you just boil it, uh, blanch it a little bit as well, again, and then you eat it with a little bit of salt and it goes very well with your rice. Then of course we have buah rambe, um, buah raba, which is a small purple um, mango and that's sweet and sour. And then here we have buah mawang, which is a we call it also the wood mango. So you see on the outside, it has this very thick brown skin. So you peel that away. And then inside it has uh, a, quite a fibrous mango, which um, can be very sweet when it's ripe. And uh, people use it for making, you can use it for making ice cream. You can use it just for ulam. The fruit in the middle is buah tara. Now, buah tara um, is somewhat related to the jackfruit family. So jackfruit, your fruit tends to be about that big. And then you get the champada, where your fruit is about that big. And then buah tara, the fruit of the tara is quite small, maybe about the tip of your finger. Or if you get a nice big one, then it's, it's the size of the tip of your thumb. And its texture is finer than the nanka. It's softer, finer, and also just as fragrant. When you're, again, walking through the jungles, as we tend to do here, when you're hiking through, you can always smell when Bahtarap is in season. And of course, if you want to go and see the orangutans, you, can't, you won't see them if all the fruits are in season because they'll be just enjoying their um, banquet that they have ready for them in the forest. The red fruit is buah kandong. Um, I can only describe it as a small uh, mangosteen. So it's about, yeah, it's about quite small. It's about that big. When you open it, it looks like a small mangosteen and the whole fruit can be used. You can dry the skins and it becomes uh, like asam nipis. So the asam skin, so you can dry the skin um, and also just eat the fruit as it is naturally. So, so the skin is actually a little bit sour when you bite into it. Ah, now we come to our cooked food. And so here, of course, is the very iconic um, Sarat Laksa, which Anthony Bourdain, of course, termed it as the breakfast of the gods. When he first came in to Borneo, he found that born in, he said that in Borneo, he found the best kind of adventure. And of course, we all like to think that his culinary adventure was included in all those adventures. So this is the iconic Sarawak laksa, which was voted top, um, top food in, the, I can't remember the name of the survey that was just done a couple of months ago. So here, if you're lazy, you can buy the Sarawak laksa paste. 
And then what you do is how you cook it is you get your chicken bones and then you boil your prawns. So you boil that all together. Then you take your prawns out, peel them, put them aside for your, for your garnishing later. Same with the chicken. You can take out your chicken and you can debone it and put everything back in. And then you would sieve it. Uh, and then you would bring it to a boil again and add in the santan. And then you can use it either with bihun or yellow noodles. Um, yeah, and then the, the garnishing is the chicken, the prawns. You can add some omelette if you like, a uh, finely sliced omelette. And then here we have it with, uh, in this photo, it's kin chai, which is Chinese celery. Or usually people would prefer to have it with uh, coriander, young coriander. And then, of course, it's accompanied with the limau kasturi and the fried sambal blachan. So these are all the accompaniments for the Sarawak laksa. So what actually goes into the Sarawak laksa paste? You have, uh, if you want to start from scratch, you can find recipes online. And it tells you that it has um, shallots, garlic, um, dried chili, buakaras, langkwas, lemongrass. So there's a whole myriad of different ingredients that go inside the paste. So if you're lazy or if you're going overseas, generally what we tend to bring um, when we're going for a longer holiday overseas with family, yeah, we'll bring some laksa paste and then cook up a pot of sraat laksa for them. And here is something that each tribe in Sarawak has. And each tribe has their own different recipes of what they put inside. And this is called panso. And panso generally is anything that can be cooked in the bamboo. And the story behind panso is also, again, of farmers going into the fields. You don't want to be carrying your pots and pans with you. So what they would do is generally they go and cut down the bamboo and then just wash it in the stream, prepare your fire, and you would cook with whatever meats you have. If you, had, if you saw some game or some wild chickens, then you would cook with chicken. If you had wild boar, then you would cook it with boar meat. Or if you were in the paddy fields and there were fishes in the water, then you can do also a seafood panso. And the general accom accompaniments tend to be um, lemongrass, ginger, um, what else do we put? Uh, some people put kunyit. My mother doesn't put kunyit. And what you see there, the little white stalks is what we call tapus, which is a family of the ginger. It's, a, it's called red ginger wort. And tapus is very fragrant. It has a coriander-like taste. I don't actually like coriander, but I do love my tapus. And then you can, if you have tapus, you actually don't have to add in the ginger. And you mix in um, crushed tapioca leaf. You can also add in a couple of uh, petals from the bunga kantan. You can see the pink bunga kantan down, that are there in the lower corner. And then what you do is my mom uses down unkudu, which is the noni leaf. And you can use that to wrap the tapioca leaves. And then you use that as a stopper for the bamboo. And then so while you're cooking your Panso on the fire, the stopper actually gets steamed and then it softens. And then that also becomes one of your accompaniments for your, for your dish. You don't add water to anything when you're cooking in panso because the natural juices will flow out from the chicken um, and also from all the other leaves and all that. And then, of course, you get a very nice stock and it makes for a very tasty meal. And this is our, on the left, you'll see kampuami, which is a fuchao dish. And then on the right there, you have kolomi. And they also have mikolok, which is done with beef. And is a, these are all very popular dishes. I know when my husband comes home from any time, if he's been long time away, he will actually message one of the kids and he says, you know, can you get me kolomi for dinner when we come home? And We've even um, had friends requesting, we've taken this as far as Nepal and Sri Lanka. Um, people were requesting us to tapao, to do a takeaway and pack it off and bring it with us when we go on our journeys. 
So that's the pop. It's a very simple dish, but it's just very tasty. And here, of course, we have our Sarawakian kue mue. We have a very wide variety, and these, these are just a few for me to show you. So, of course, we have kue lapis. Kue lapis actually um, originated in Indonesia, as I think most of us know here. But kue lapis Sarawak has patterns. Kue lapis Indonesia just tends to be um, the different layers of the cake, and the original is done with the five spice powder. But kue lapis Sarawak, I, I don't know who started um, making all these different patterns. I actually learned how to do this and I bought all the, the thing for pressing the thing, but you, it's so time consuming. You have to bake every layer and then to make the patterns, you have to bake different cakes and then cut them out and then slice them into, into triangles. And then you piece it all together using a strawberry jam or some other jam that you might have. And then here, this one's done by my friend, Marissa uh, of uh, Raz Cakes. And she does beautiful designs. She has actually sent hers um, to, she gets orders from London and Paris. And she, because the Que Lapis actually travels quite well, uh, it can last outside of the refrigerator for um, a week to 10 days if it's uh, kept well ventilated. And so it travels well. And so she has sent them all around the world, I would say. So she's one of our very successful uh, Que Lapis entrepreneurs. And then of course we have the traditional cakes. And so these are some of the things that you can see on a daily basis now. And with Gawai coming up, this is the, 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 all these cakes will be served during the Gawai festival. So you can see the, we call it the UFO cake, the brown round one. Now the skill with making this is called Panyaram. The skill with making this is to ensure that you have um, the sides turn up and that sort of gives it that UFO look. And so this one here is made with gula apong. And then next to it, you can see there we have kue jala, so net cake. So this is also made by frying um, rice, rice flour batter. And then of course, on top of there, we have kue chap, which is made, the pattern is taken from the brass rings that you see in the photo there. And then here we have bubur padas. I think Hapsa, I think your mom must have cooked bubur padas for you. Another very Sarawakian dish. And this is only cooked during Bulan Puasa here. So every, this is what something during Puasa that everybody looks forward to. And this is the big pot there that you see. Um, her name is Nya Nya. So she has, she makes the bumbu. The bumbu is the spices that have to be dried in the sun and then you dry fry them and then you grind them. And then the other ingredients that you see that would go into her big pot would be um, prawns, um, chicken, all finely cut. You get uh, beef skin, long beans, young corn, bean curd skin, dried mushrooms, turmeric leaves. So all of that goes in there and then it's all cooked up and served for buka puasa. So it's something that all Sarawakians actually have learned to like and look forward to. And then on, this is what is, I was mentioning earlier, tumpik. So this is our chef Min. So she was doing a cooking demo showing you tumpik. So it's sago flour uh, mixed with desiccated coconut. And you can actually make it, uh, and, and salt. So you can make it savory or sweet. You can serve it with um, prawns or you can serve it with gula apong. It's uh, like a coconut pancake and something that is seeing a great revival now, um, especially this is one of the main dishes that we have been promoting under our culinary heritage. And then of course, the fuchao kompia. Now the story behind this kompia is a very, it's like a hard bagel um, and you can stuff it. You can eat it as it is. You buy it in Cebu and they cook it uh, in, the, in the huge oven. And you can see them taking the dough and then they will actually stick it to the side of the oven and let it bake in that oven. Um, and the story was, because it lasts very long as well. So the story is that during the, the times of war in China, when the young man was going um, to war, his mother would ask him to take a bite of the kompia and she would put it aside and keep it for him for when he came back, because this bread actually does tend to keep for a very long time. 
and you can reconstitute it by steaming, by, by, by putting it on top of your hot rice when you want to eat. So it travels very easily. And then, of course, we have new innovations by young chefs who are coming back into Sarawak. Um, some of these here, if you see the, the one in the middle there with the slice of lime, that is salai butter, which we just had recently. Some of these dishes, I just had it like two or three nights ago, and this was done by the university here, UCSI, and their students were presenting this for a uh, foodish, for the foodish food trip. And you can see um, on the right hand corner that dish is representing a gold bar and there's actually a piece of gold leaf there um, served with a tarong asam cream and smoked mani chai leaves on the top right hand corner there you can see it's a take on our favorite dish here tomato mi um, and so this was done with a quail and he, he they said it represented quarantine where we're all just nestled in our own little safe, safety net at home during the whole quarantine. And that is actually fried um, curly noodles, which they use for kolomi. And then next to that, you can see the, is the tarong asam ball. And this was served with a lobster consomme and uh, sprinkled with Sarawak pepper. And then on the top left, that one is actually a take on panso that I was showing you. So they actually, um, have a like a chicken roulade and then they they seared it on the outside so you get crispy chicken and it was served with paku and red rice and then on the bottom left hand corner just to show you some of the innovations in the artistry that we have in Sarawak we have a long history of pottery making and so this was um, a project uh, which was called Dine on Clay where this pottery maker um, Tucson joined up with Chef Achang, who was making the gold bar there. And they, they, a group of them came together and they presented this Dine on Clay event, which all of us thoroughly enjoyed. And then of course we come to our festivals and our celebrations. We have so much here to share with everybody. So we have Kuching Festival, which is again going to start this year. Um, that's always held in August every year. We haven't been able to hold it for two years. <clears throat> of course, we have the Gawai Harvest Festival and uh, we have all our culinary heritage street food festivals. So all of these photos here that you can see are from our street food festivals and Chitrawarna. And then of course, we have a great history of hospitality here with all our open houses. The Dayaks will have open house for their Gawai Harvest Festival. Christians will have open house at Christmas. The Chinese will have their open house for Chinese New Year. And then we just finished celebrating Hari Raya, where after two years, we were able to go and visit with all our Muslim friends. And these are some of the other festivals that I'd just like to mention very quickly here. Again, as I said earlier on, it was the Kuching Festival and Food Fair. Um, this year it's scaled down to only 250 stalls and they only expect 500,000 visitors. Pre-pandemic, they had like three to 400 stalls and 1 million visitors in three weeks. So you can imagine the scale of that. And then of course you can see the, the Two photos at the bottom of this slide here were taken during the Rainforest World Music Festival. And we had food demonstrations and we engaged with all the different communities, all the different ethnic communities and showed them that they could make money during the Rainforest Music Festival. And this year it'll be held in the middle of June. So if you're planning to visit, do check it out. And as I mentioned earlier on, our culinary heritage street food festivals. Our next one will be in September. And that comes to the conclusion of my talk. And so this is my family here. Wishing you Slamat Hari Gawai, Gayu Guru Grai Nyamai, which means good health, prosperity, and a long life. Over to you, Hapsa. Wow, Jonah. You don't need an hour, you need at least a day. I like, know, I know right? you need to just touch the surface of what you have. Yeah. yeah, I was looking at the clock and I was like, oh my God. <laughs> yeah, and uh, 
We don't have much time for a question, but we'll do some. Yeah. But for now, I'd like to ask just one question for myself. Uh -huh. uh, I, on my last visit, I noticed that there are quite a few, a few new restaurants which serve ethnic food. Is this an indication that young people, or rather generally, people are accepting more of this kind of cuisine? I think it and, is. Uh, yeah. yeah. I think, and I another think... question. Oh, okay. Yeah, Another question is, uh, packaging upriver and all those other remote places, are they now still using the same old ways, using the, the natural leaves, or have they resorted to plastic? I hope not. Uh -huh. Well, I think I, it's, it's faster for me to answer your uh, last question. They, of course, went to use plastic because it's much easier, but now we're very happy to see a resurgence of them moving back to using leaves. Um, I think it's just the whole environmental awareness uh, and, and, and education that's coming through. And uh, even like in Cebu town, they have banned um, polystyrene. And in Kuching, the mayor has, the mayor here has launched their uh, no more plastic straws. And so they estimated that they have stopped like 1.2 million plastic straws from going into the environment. So it's good to see that we're actually moving back to using more of our natural leaves um, and making baskets for our for the containers. Like you can see earlier on um, uh, when I was talking about the buahangkala. So those little baskets were actually made by the stall holder. So coming to the new restaurants, it's something that um was starting pre-pandemic but also during the pandemic some of the chefs were stuck here so you can see one of the dishes that i was talking about earlier on like the lobster consomme um, so one of those chefs he was working in a michelin star restaurant in shanghai and then when mco came he was stuck here um, so chef alex managed to find some backers and he's opened up a new restaurant now in kuching and they're helping to upgrade and to show the youth that we can actually uh, bring our local ingredients into the fine dining scene. But also coming back down to the more traditional side, like Ruma Asap, um, you see a lot of young people actually getting involved now in uh, uh, food, the food industry. That's such a wonderful thing to know. Okay, the next question, Donna, I think we just have enough time for another one. Mm -hmm. uh, the question is, what is a typical wedding banquet in the Longhouse? Oh, a typical wedding banquet. Well, they don't tend to have their banquets in the Longhouse anymore. When I got married in 1985, my grandmother requested that we go back to the Longhouse and have a traditional um, Longhouse wedding. And I think when we held that, they hadn't had a wedding in the longhouse for about 15 years because it was more convenient to go to town and eat in the restaurant and be done with it. So as I was saying, my mother had to make seven jars of tua. And I think we had four pigs, um, probably about 30 chickens, and we had one cow. So, uh, and uh, the night before they brought the cow to the longhouse and my sisters and I were all there and the poor cow just mooed the whole night. So the next day, yeah, we didn't partake of any beef the next day because we just didn't have the heart. So, yeah. And then of course, copious amounts of tuak during the wedding and then the rice. Uh, and it's, it's a whole, the whole longhouse gets involved. You have to inform your twai ruma, you're the head of the head of the longhouse if you're coming back to do your, your event at home. And then the wedding party has to walk the full length. The wedding party has to walk the full length of the longhouse. And then each billet will serve you um, tua. And so you have to taste tua all along the longhouse. So that's what I would say would have been a typical uh, wedding banquet in the longhouse. And uh, that was fabulous. Uh, I'm afraid we are running out of time and I wouldn't have enough. I don't think we have enough time to answer any more questions. No, I've got all my ingredients here. 
stuff oh, for you guys to come and see. I think you need to do a few sessions of this, Jonna. Uh, <laughs> inshallah, that is it. But before we go, I would like to thank everyone for your interest and participation in Spotlight on Sarawak, Talk Sarawak. And thank you to our major supporter, Petra Energy Berhad, and our other donors, Creative Foundation, Chayamata Sarawak Berhad, Cope Private Equity Sindhian Berhad, and Centric PR Sindhian Berhad for supporting this endeavor. I'm pleased to hand over back to Vanessa Badan Warisan. Pleasure. And thank you, everyone, again, and especially to our wonderful speaker, Datin Jona Jurui. You are you. a champion. <laughs> <laughs> You've got your mother's genes for sure. Hi, thank you. Thank yeah. you. <laughs> thank you. Goodbye. And Vanessa, over to you. Hey. Thank, thank you. Thank you very much, Hapsa, for being our gracious and lovely moderator for today's talk. Thank you, Datindana, for sharing your knowledge and providing us with fascinating insights on Sarawak's unique and exotic food heritage and for introducing us with many new fruits and dishes that are not well known here outside of Sarawak. Much of it looks very tasty. I think many of us are quite hungry right now. <laughs> I think one needs to be quite adventurous and brave to try some of these items too. For our audience, thank you very much for tuning in for today's talk in our webinar series on Spotlight on Sarawak and for all your comments and questions. We hope you will join us on Thursday 9th of June at 5 p.m. for Dr. John Ting's talk on the Brook government's forts in Sarawak in the era 1844 to 1938. If you have not yet registered for this talk, please visit Badan Warisan Malaysia's website at badanwarisan.org.my and in the events section, you can register for this talk as well as the other remaining two talks in this Talk Sarawak series on 23rd of June for traditional textiles and costumes by Dr. Weilin Jehong. And finally, on 7th July for Sarawak's Endangered Heritage by James Yong, with the closing of the series by Puan Suri Elizabeth Mogi. Please follow Badan Warisan Malaysia on our website. You can subscribe to our e-newsletter, Jindela Warisan, or follow us on Facebook and Instagram for more information on upcoming talks and news on heritage in Malaysia. Badan Warisan Malaysia is an independent non-government organization and we do not receive any financial support from the government. If you have enjoyed today's talk and wish to support our educational and advocacy work, please donate to Badan Warisan Malaysia. Details are available here on the screen. Thank you very much in advance for your kind support. On behalf of Badan Warisan Malaysia, we wish to express our appreciation to our donors, supporters, and the team behind our Spotlight on Sarawak series. Thank you once again and enjoy your evening. <laughs>